Colorado has always been a place for mountain escapes, for people to come and relax and enjoy themselves and enjoy our scenery, climb a peak, canoe across a lake. Tourism is Colorado's biggest economy. As transportation changed, tourism changed, the facilities changed. Once Americans began to fall in love with the automobile, things really changed here. The roads were awful, the cars were unreliable, you never knew if you were going to make it to your destination. I wouldn't have faulted anybody who thought this will be a sparsely populated place. And it would have been just astonishing to come out to this kind of scenery that they never would have been able to see. It really was revelatory and a change that hasn't passed even now. This program was generously made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you. Thank you. Tourism has always been a part of Colorado's economy, but it's evolved along with changing transportation technology from stagecoaches to railroads, uh, ultimately to automobiles. People have been looking for newer and better and, and more reliable ways to get into the mountains to enjoy our mountain scenery. Of course, human beings have been coming to the Rocky Mountains since time immemorial. The Ute people spent their summers camping by lakes such as Grand Lake. And they would hunt and fish, and they'd harvest the lodgepole pines, these very straight, skinny trees that we have, which are teepee poles. Beginning with people like William Byers, the publisher of the Rocky Mountain News, Coloradans have been promoting our scenery and our state as a getaway location for people to come and hike and hunt and fish and relax and camp and enjoy themselves. And certainly railroads were involved in promoting Colorado's scenic wonders. They promoted Colorado as the Switzerland of America. And that tagline attracted people from all over the east and from across the ocean, really from all over the world. Tourism has always been Colorado's bread and butter. We were in the ski industry business. We had skating and tubing hills. Winter tourism meant everything. Denver had the fantastic National Western Stock Show every January. In the summer, tourism to the national parks, Mesa Verde, Colorado National Monument, the Great Sand Dunes, and Rocky Mountain National Park, it allowed businesses to expand and to prosper to get to the Colorado high country. Any mountain town, its economy is totally related to the weather. So people could come to Grand Lake in the summertime, and they did, because it was so much cooler and, you know, the cities were icky. But in the wintertime, they'd all go away. They came over birthed and they brought boats on wagon, and they built by having horses drag building materials to a third of the lake across the ice. They couldn't get there in the summertime. That was really unique. And it's interesting, it, tourism sort of followed where the mining rushes went in the early days. 1859, Pikes Peak or bust. People poured across the plains looking for gold. A lot of them stayed here and settled in those mountain towns. And when those towns went bust, a lot of them survived, like Grand Lake, like Breckenridge, like Leadville, like Aspen. But the train, then the bus, then the car, got people up to these secret gems that were hidden in the mountains, got people access to fresh air and being able to watch stars at night. Right now, it gets dark and you look up and it's another world. It's just beautiful. High up in the Colorado Rockies lies Grand Lake, headwaters of the mighty Colorado River, located at the western gateway to Rocky Mountain National Park. At an elevation of 8,369 feet, Grand Lake is Colorado's largest natural body of water, as well as one of the state's oldest tourist destinations. Rich in both natural history and western lore, Grand Lake truly embodies the essence of a Colorado mountain paradise. It is shocking how remote a place like Grand Lake is, but tourists began to find their way here as early as the 1860s. They first came on horseback and pack mule. Which actually back in the day when pioneers and homesteaders were here was the supply town for mining in what is now Rocky Mountain National Park primarily and everything else around here. The Moffat Road reached Middle Park by the 1880s and 
And that, of course, opened up new opportunities for tourist developers. And the railroad stretched over Rollins Pass and down into Fraser and into the Winter Park area, but it never reached Grand Lake. So even at the height of the railroad lines, people still had to buy a ticket to a railroad station and then take a stagecoach all the way up here to Grand Lake. But as Grand Lake began establishing itself as a tourist destination, people began developing lodges and stagecoach lines to get people from the cities on the Front Range deep into the Rocky Mountains. We have people of elegance wanting to ride in comfort and arrive at a place where they will be far from home, but with really every comfort of home and maybe more comforts than home would have. And then it was fairly expensive to stay here. And so it was only wealthy people primarily who'd come up and book for a month or the whole summer. The Kaufman House was the last Victorian hotel to be built along the lake, 1892. And it was built by a man named Ezra Kaufman who was a Mennonite guy originally out of Ohio. They ran that place from 1892 until 1946, long after Ezra's death. It was won by his wife and children. And it tells the story of life in a Victorian tourist economy. It tells the story of how people eventually started pitching tents on the lake and then made cottages or, or cabins that were often very similar to the tent because there's this very short building season. Around the turn of the century, F.O. Stanley over in Estes Park, famous for the Stanley Steamer, introduced automobile traffic to the Rocky Mountain area. And with the advent and growth of automobile traffic, especially in the post-World War I era, and the growth of Henry Ford's Model T, more and more people owned personal automobiles. That spurred the development of roads. The automobile brought national parks to Americans, and they were able to go out and see them. The train brought everybody to the West. The advent of the car gave people the opportunity to go and see. But it probably, after 1920, that's when highway developers constructed Fall River Road through Rocky Mountain National Park. That's the year that Berthet Pass opened to automobile traffic. After 1920, you can actually drive your cars over the mountains to reach a place like Grand Lake. And so you had the development of rudimentary hotels. First, uh, at least in this region, they were dude ranches. And then that gradually grew into uh, the motor court, like here at the Smith Essex Cottages. And then these motor hotels, these motels, uh, that had been serving hunters and the wealthy now were accessible to everyday people. These were folks from all over the place, as far away as California, Missouri. Many were coming from the Front Range because it was hot -er there, and the cool climate here and all the beauties of Rocky Mountain National Park. It's just glorious up here. Automobile technology was nothing like it is today, and the cars were not designed for the Rocky Mountains, and so people had to improvise. They tied ropes around their tires so that the cars wouldn't slip on steep inclines. They would very often go up steep grades in reverse because that was the lowest gear that they had on their car. Very often, uh, people would have their passengers get out and walk to the top of the hill or, or down to the bottom before they navigated down the rough track that constituted an automobile road in the 1920s. Once Americans began to fall in love with the automobile, things really changed here. Clyde Eslick and his father built this very unusual circa 1915 motor court building. It catered specifically to those individual automobile owners. When you can see the, the rooms are rather small, but the interesting feature about this facility is that there was a place to park your car. That was unusual. That was not, that was sort of an atypical development for the inns at least that were existing in, in this area. It's a precursor to motels. There's an integrated roof line, one roof line, and there's four accommodation units that are 12 by 14 next to little carports that are maybe nine by 14. Clyde Eslick, we know, really loved his cars. And he would often run errands for people, pick people up, take them shopping, anything to get in the car. With the growth of Henry Ford's Model T, automobile ownership, uh, the lodging evolved to accommodate that. Prior to that, they set up a camping space for automobiles so that people could travel and just camp, throw out a bedroll somewhere because nobody had really keyed into the fact that these overnight travelers who would maybe spend just one night somewhere, very transient, were gonna need a place to stay. But surely in this town, this Smith Eslick Cottage Court was really early, 1915. This was really a revelation. When people in town looked at it early on, they would say, well, that's a shed. No, it's a very humble, unique building, but it is still stick built with milled pine, done by the family and then covered with what we call barky. When they'd mill their lumber, they'd take off that barky stuff and 
Well, cast it aside, people discovered that it was attractive, and more to the point, they could cut it up and make all kinds of designs. And the only insulation was rolled cardboard, which was sponge painted like a kindergartner might, with little colors on painted cardboard, and that was it. So if you were staying in here in spring or fall, you'd be cold at night. Each of the units had a cast iron wood stove in the corner, a drop down small kitchen table, two legs drop down, sometimes maybe even a shelf, and something to sleep on. And that was it. They had used the outhouse, children, parents, all stuffed into one accommodation unit, which was exactly what everybody did back then. That was well before anybody had restaurants that were open all the time. But at any rate, it was very, very humble and simple. But it had a roof, and the best part was that it, the cars were safe. The Aslicks were an interesting couple. They did not have children. Mrs. Aslick had been both the county clerk and a school teacher. Clyde was a handyman of all sorts and did both new construction and he maintained a lot of the older homes around the lake. Clyde must have had the keys to virtually every house in town because during the winter he shoveled the roofs for snow, he uh, opened the houses in the spring, turned the water back on, got people's boats and boathouses ready for their arrival in May and June. He was quite the essential person. Well, everybody loved Clyde. And then he was a big bear of a man. And when people talk about Clyde Eslick, and there's a lot of folks who knew him, they talk about how lovable he was and affable, and he's just a kind guy. A half mile to the west of the Smith Eslick Cottage Court, overlooking the picturesque Grand Lake, is the majestic Grand Lake Lodge, which represents yet another chapter in the evolving relationship of auto tourism and the next best spot to rest your head at night. The historic Grand Lake Lodge was completed on July 3rd of 1920. Its main goal was to be completed before the Trail Ridge Road was done and open to help create and enhance the tourism industry that was coming to the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park. The National Park Service adopted a style of architecture known as Western Stick Style. Western Stick Style evolved from the Adirondack style of architecture, which incorporated natural elements, meaning the bark left on certain elements of the construction. Structurally, the Grand Lake Lodge reminds a lot of folks about the great national parks in Yellowstone and Glacier. Sturdy pine structures, high vaulted ceilings, and great engineering and workmanship from the 1920s. The front porch of the lodge is 120 feet long, making it an enormous view viewing gallery. Both of the lakes are visible, the Grand Lake, the Shadow Mountain Reservoir, and all of the beautiful mountains that we can see. It's always been a popular destination and is called Colorado's favorite front porch. When the lodge was built in 1920, there was no power. So they built a, a, a small power facility up on the Tanahutu Creek, about a mile and a half up in the park. And they built a, a settling pond and then a filtration system. And then they had a big flume where they diverted water to an old Pelton water wheel inside the powerhouse. And it was a generator. And they strung almost a mile and a half of power line through the trees all the way down to the Grand Lake Lodge. By 1920, only one in 10 Coloradans owned an automobile. So how do you escape to the mountains? There were some precedents for bus travel into national parks. Chief among them was Glacier National Park. And the gentleman ran a very successful bus business up in Glacier. His name was Roe Emery. He later became known as the father of Colorado tourism. And he came up with this amazing idea of what's been known ever since as the circle tour. People would arrive by rail into Denver. They would be picked up by Emery's buses. They would be driven up to Estes Park, where he had a chalet. They would stay overnight in Estes. The next morning, they would drive over Fall River Road, and then they would stay, presumably, at another facility on the west side of the park. And then the next morning, they would be driven down to Idaho Springs, where they would stay in another Emory property called the Hot Springs Hotel. The following morning, they would return to Denver and complete the Great Circle Tour. When Emory saw that location, he arranged for some financing from some very wealthy Eastern financiers, and they decided to build the Grand Lake Lodge as part of his Great Circle Tour puzzle. His bus tours of the Rocky Mountains attracted thousands of Coloradans and tourists from outside of Colorado who never would have been able to afford the trip to the mountains in the first place. Where the swimming pool is now was actually a circular road. The buses would pull in and pull a U-turn, unload all the luggage, bellhops would come, load the luggage onto the 
big trucks, and then they would drive up the hill and deposit the luggage at the individual cabins. And then you would go down to the main lodge, which is where the food was, it's where the drink was, it's where the entertainment was, and it's where the view was. And that, to me, is indicative of how tourism was different in those days. He was a very forward-thinking and visionary individual and saw the opportunities and wanted to make the beauties of America available to the traveling public. We got the Grand Lake Lodge in 1950. My grandfather and his brother were bus operators. My grandfather was the president of a company that would become Greyhound. His brother was the president of a company that would become Continental Trailways. And they were in Chicago and they had offices, same floor across a busy street. And they both saw the Wall Street Journal article at the same time, held the newspaper up, did hand signals and they decided to buy the Rocky Mountain Transportation Company. With it came the Estes Park Chalet, the Grand Lake Lodge, Hidden Valley Ski Area, and the concession to operate Trail Ridge Store. In 1973, on July 3rd, we had a grease fire in the kitchen at the Grand Lake Lodge. My sister and I were in a boat in the middle of Grand Lake and we could see the smoke and then we saw the flames. We panicked, parked the boat at, Pound, at Town Beach and we ran from the shore up the hill. The firemen stopped us at the pool. They were draining the pool. The chemicals in the pool water helped put out the fire. They were able to save the main structure. The lodge sat for eight long years. Grand County did not want us to rebuild, did not give us a building permit. They thought the structure was dangerous. Two architectural firms in Denver stated we could use a facility. So my brother, three really wonderful maintenance men, I even helped use draw knives and we peeled all the lodge pole sandblasted the fireplaces, unfortunately had to add carpet to the beautiful hardwood. We rebuilt the kitchen. We were able to salvage the walk-ins, the big gigantic mixers and potato peelers, and we reopened in 1980 the hotel portion. In 81, we contacted a local restaurateur, brought the reputation of the Grand Lake Lodge food back to an A+. We let the lodge sit because instead of tearing it down, it was a piece of history. It was beautiful, the front porch, there's nothing like it. I like to think of Grand Lake as what Colorado looked like 75 years ago. You know, we still have our uh, quaint downtown area. We still have the wooden boardwalk sidewalks. We have really authentic looking Western saloons. There's a number of great places in Colorado, but this was the real McCoy here in Grand Lake. The 1950s marked the golden age of automobiling, the affordability and availability of the automobile. Coupled with Eisenhower's 1956 National Interstate and Defense Highways Act was not only a game changer for transportation, it completely transformed tourism and lodging for a new generation of adventurous sightseers. If you think of tourism as a tiny little drip beginning in the 1860s and turning into a trickle with the railroads and a flood with the first cars, by 1956, Tourism became a gusher with the passage of the Interstate Highway Act, this federal program to connect the country ocean to ocean with these massive four or eight lane highways. Steamboat Springs is located in northwest Colorado in Route County. It's a resort community with mining and agricultural background. Route County begins as you come over Rabbit Ears Pass. My mom and dad had a business in Butte, Montana. We sold it in 1971. We're looking for a place to to start another business. So we came to Steamboat and looked around and there was three motels to choose from at that time. And against the advice of a realtor, uh, my folks decided to purchase the Rabbit Ears Motel. Their names were Ron and Lyle Kohler. We purchased the motel in April of 1971 and been here ever since, but it was quite a struggle to begin with. The ski area was just beginning to get going. Summertime wasn't a big tourism spot for Steamboat at that time, but we managed to work through it and build the motel into what it is today. But there's a lot of history in between there and a lot regarding the Rabbit Ears Motel sign. By the mid 20th century, everything had changed in terms of lodging. There were so many motels competing with each other with, with neon signs and kind of garish lights, but they all offered the latest in modern luxuries, kitchenettes, swimming pools, color television even by the 1960s. This new technology was designed to attract people off the road to pull over in their cars and spend the night. The Rabbit Ears Motel sign. It is an iconic sign. It's certainly a landmark. 
it was originally was directly in front of the building. It was red, white, and black at the time. It had an open center, and it had lights that ran around the edge of the sign, and eyes that flashed back, back and forth. It was originally built in 1952 by the Greeley Sign Company, and the owner of the motel, as legend has it, said, do something imaginative and something that people will remember, and it was installed in 1953 course the neon signs were the end thing back in the 50s. With the way the lights ran around the sign it would point towards the the motel so it would encourage you to turn into the motel. The highway that went through the Rocky Mountains was the Victory Highway uh, and that was essentially the route of US 40 today over Berthoud Pass and Rabbit Ears Pass to Steamboat Springs and beyond to Salt Lake City and it attracted a massive amount of, of tourism between the 19-teens and really the construction of the interstate in the 1960s and 70s. And so Rabbit Ears Pass and Steamboat Springs became an essential stop on this mountain tour between Denver and Salt Lake City. In 1977, the state highway said no more animation on Colorado State Highways. They wanted the sign removed from Highway 40. And the city of Steamboat had people that thought it was tacky and it took quite a legal struggle to maintain and keep the sign. So we were able to move it to where it is today back in 1977. We've repainted the sign, so it's the pink and white and tan that it is today and managed to keep the neon, although we can't have lights running around the sign. It is a landmark here in Steamboat now. It's been designated a historical landmark with Route County in August of 2003, and it was also declared a state landmark in May 26th of 2006. So it's definitely a landmark and we'll be here for as long as we're here. These snapshots into Colorado's early tourist behavior serve as great reminders of the state's transportation evolution. But the struggle to preserve stories of our past is reminiscent of early automobiles struggling backward up Colorado's steep, scenic roadways. In February of 2017, we'd just gotten a huge snowfall in January and the snow banks around the motel here were unusually high for that time of year. And there were some kids that were able to climb up the snowbank and access part of the sign so they could take pictures of the sign. They busted the neon and dented part of the sign and it just took us a long time to get the neon replaced. Neon's a dying art and there isn't a lot of people still make the glass that can bend the glass and and make it the right color so it's it's harder to get it repaired now. People from all over the state of Colorado, even outside of Colorado, were very concerned about the sign and you know if it was going to get restored and get repaired. People were calling, people were sending me letters, some people even sent me money to help get the sign repaired. And the local guy here was able to find the, the person that could do the neon and, and get it repaired. But I was just very surprised at how many people were actually really concerned about the sign. It proved to me that the sign is certainly still really important to a lot of people. We love the history of Grand Lake. My father was dying of cancer and he really wanted a state historical designation for the lodge. That meant, that meant everything to him. And so we began that process and applied first to the state of Colorado and we received state designation as a historic property. And we waited probably a year and got notification that we were a national registered landmark and got that status. My dad died probably that next year and that was something that meant everything to him. It was more the importance of history and knowing that it would be harder if we ever sold it for somebody to tear it down. So it was important to my father. He was a driving force. I think the importance of historic preservation lies in connecting the present with the past. I think it's important to understand where we've been so that we may better understand where we're going. And a place like the Grand Lake Lodge embodies that to me. It was built in 1920. It has evolved with tourism. At the Grand Lake Lodge, you sit on the porch and you feel like someone did in the 1920s. It is beautiful. It's the best vantage point. And you go into the lodge and you know you're in a one-of-a-kind, something that isn't built anymore. The feel of it, the soul of it, you know, the thing that evokes those memories, the thing that plucks those heartstrings, the sort of those indefinable things that give a place a sense of place.
Knowing that the building is 100 years old, we do face many challenges coming up with the infrastructure, the electricity, the heating, the cooling. Who knew 100 years ago that we'd have Wi-Fi available in all the buildings on property? According to the Colorado Tourism Office, the state welcomed over 82 million visitors in 2016. As time continues to tick forward, future visitors will have the opportunity to observe the same vistas and stay in the same lodges as their ancestors. Today, tourism is a multi-billion dollar industry in Colorado. Travelers come anywhere from the Front Range, as far away as Alaska, to come and enjoy the history and the surroundings of the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park. This National Register historic place really takes people back a century ago to the very beginning of automobile tourism in Colorado. You see viewscapes that are very much what people saw 100 years ago. That's always good when we are connected with the people of the past and whether it's a pink rabbit or a bark slab cottage. Yeah, the sign has been in its existence for over 60 years. It's welcomed travelers into the steamboat for a long time and will continue to be there. And places like the Grand Lake Lodge provide the opportunity to experience travel the way it used to be. Being able to walk into a place that is preserved and looks like it must have looked a hundred years ago is really something that attracts people. It certainly is a good way to educate young people about their roots. The old hotels, the old Victorian hotels, hotels such as the Grand Lake Lodge from the 1920s, hotels like the Rabbit Ears Motel from the 1950s and 60s all give you slices of of different kinds of experiences, of, of what tourism was like at various times in Colorado. So you can understand and, and really appreciate what we have today and how it compares to what people had in the past.